This is Bone Chillers to disturb your dreams. Dare to join us? Click subscribe. Ring the bell. But remember, we cannot guarantee your safety from the nightmares that await. Prepare to be thrilled, chilled, and filled with a sense of dread you'll find nowhere else. Welcome to the darkness. We've been waiting. Shadows in the backyard, the black-eyed children. The Simpson family had just moved into a quiet suburban neighborhood. It was an idyllic spot. Houses that lined the streets bore the charm of vintage design, lawns meticulously manicured and sidewalks freshly swept. One evening, as the orange hue of sunset basked the town, Tim, the eldest of the Simpson children, spotted two figures in the backyard. From his bedroom window, they looked like ordinary children. One was slightly taller, possibly a teen, and the other much younger, maybe seven or eight. The odd thing was, neither of them were playing or moving. They just stood there, looking at the house. Curiosity got the better of him. He decided to approach them. As he stepped out, an overwhelming feeling of dread washed over him, but he dismissed it as nerves. Hey, Tim called out, are you guys lost? The taller one spoke in a voice so monotone it was eerie. We need to come in, can you let us in? As Tim drew closer, the streetlight revealed their eyes. They were completely black. No whites, no irises, just an abyss. Chilled to the bone, Tim stuttered. I, uh, I need to ask my parents. Please, let us in, we won't be long, the younger one whispered. His voice carried a haunting plea. Tim didn't wait to respond. He sprinted back into the house, slamming and locking the door behind him. Mom, Dad, he yelled, running into the living room where his parents were watching television. There are two kids in our backyard with entirely black eyes. His father, Mark, raised an eyebrow. You're joking, right? No, Dad, I'm serious. Without a word, Mark got up and peered through the curtains. Sure enough, two children stood there, their black eyes staring intently at the house. Turning to his wife, Mark whispered, Linda, keep the kids upstairs, I'll handle this. But before he could react, the doorbell rang, echoing an unnerving chime. Linda held her breath. Mark cautiously approached the door. Through the peephole, he saw the two black-eyed children. The taller one spoke, his voice clear and calm. Sir, we need to come in, please let us in. Mark felt an irrational urge to obey, but every instinct screamed not to. We don't want any trouble, Mark responded, trying to sound assertive. You need to leave. But sir, the younger one's voice trailed, we're scared, alone. Minutes felt like hours. The atmosphere in the house grew thick with tension. The doorbell rang intermittently, each chime more insistent than the last. Linda decided to call the police. As she dialed, the phone line was nothing but static. She tried her cell phone, but there was no signal. Finally, with a deep breath, Mark decided to confront the children. He grabbed a flashlight and went out through the back. But when he shone the light towards where they stood, they were gone. Relief washed over the family, thinking it was over. But around midnight, as everyone settled into bed, they heard a soft tapping sound. It came from Tim's window, and there they stood, the black-eyed children, their gaze penetrating the darkness. The tapping grew louder and was soon joined by whispers. Let us in. We won't be long. Morning came with no further incident. The children had disappeared. However, the trauma lingered and the Simpsons decided to visit their elderly neighbour, Mrs. Darnell, hoping she might have some insight. Mrs. Darnell's face turned ashen when they mentioned the black-eyed children. They're legends around here, she whispered. Children of the shadows. They visit homes seeking entry. No one truly knows their purpose, but those who let them in, they're never seen again. The Simpson family decided to move, leaving behind their dream home. They never encountered the black-eyed children again, but the memory haunted their nights. In the abandoned house on a moonlit evening, shadows danced in the backyard. Two figures, children with eyes as black as the night, stood waiting for the next inhabitant, their whispers carried by the wind. Let us in. We won't be long. Babysitter's nightmare. The evening was calm and cool. In one of the posh suburban houses, a light flickered in an upstairs window. Jenna, a 17-year-old with curly brown hair and glasses, sat in the lavish living room. She was engrossed in her book, 
occasionally glancing at the baby monitor to ensure the kids were still sound asleep. It was her first time babysitting for the Wright family, who had a reputation for being quite particular about who they let into their home. The clock struck nine. Jenna's phone buzzed with a text from her friend, which she quickly replied to before returning to her book. Not long after, the house phone rang. She picked it up cautiously. Hello? A voice, almost a whisper, said, Check on the children. Thinking it was some sort of prank call or maybe even the rights checking in on her, Jenna chuckled. Of course, they're safe and sound. She hung up, feeling a little unnerved. To put her mind at ease, she checked the baby monitor again. All seemed well, just the rhythmic breathing of little Lucy and Max. However, just as she settled back, the phone rang again. Hello? Jenna's voice was shaky now. Again, that whisper. Did you check on the children? Frustrated and anxious, Jenna retorted, Who is this? This isn't funny. But the line was dead. Jenna decided to head upstairs to ensure the kids were okay. The hallway was eerily quiet as she approached the children's bedroom. She gently pushed the door open. Lucy and Max, bundled in their blankets, looked serene in their sleep. Relieved, Jenna returned downstairs. She considered calling the police, but decided against it, thinking it was likely just a bored teenager making prank calls. But as the minutes ticked on, her paranoia increased. Every small noise in the house made her jump. Then the phone rang again. This time, Jenna answered angrily, Stop calling! The whisper was more menacing now. Look out the window! Frozen with fear, Jenna slowly turned to the window. There was no one there, but she noticed something chilling. The reflection in the glass showed a silhouette of a man standing just behind her. She spun around, but there was no one in the room. Confused and terrified, she bolted upstairs to grab the kids. She collected both Lucy and Max in her arms, rushing into the master bedroom. She locked the door and called the police. 911, what's your emergency? There's someone in the house. I'm babysitting and I keep getting these calls. And then I thought I saw someone, Jenna rambled, tears streaming down her face. Stay calm, we'll trace the call. Keep the children with you and stay on the line. Jenna huddled in a corner of the room, holding the children close. Minutes felt like hours. Suddenly, the phone rang again, causing Jenna to jump. A different voice spoke, one of authority. Jenna, this is Officer Daniels. We've traced the call. It's coming from inside the house. Get out now. Without thinking, Jenna unlocked the door and raced down the stairs, clutching the kids. She didn't look back. Once outside, she ran to a neighbor's house, pounding on the door until they answered and let her in. The police arrived within minutes, storming the right house. Jenna watched from the neighbor's window, her heart racing as officers escorted a tall, disheveled man out in handcuffs. He looked directly at Jenna, his cold eyes sending shivers down her spine. Officer Daniels approached Jenna after ensuring the intruder was secured in the police car. You did well, he said. The man had been hiding in the attic for days. It appears he had some fixation with the Wright family. Jenna shuddered. Those calls. Daniels nodded gravely. His way of toying with you. We found an old landline phone in the attic. It's lucky you got out when you did. Days turned into weeks and the trauma of that night began to fade. Jenna vowed never to babysit again. But one thing continued to haunt her. If the man had been in the house for days... How many nights had the right children been asleep, with him lurking just above? Lady of the Lake, Cabin in the Woods Horror deep within the dense woods of Montecito, surrounded by tall, whispering pine trees, stood an old wooden cabin that overlooked a picturesque, serene lake. It was this tranquility that lured the Hernandez family to spend their vacation there, Rafael and Clara Hernandez, along with their two children, 10-year-old Mia and 8-year-old Diego, arrived at the cabin in high spirits. Little did they know the lake had a chilling tale. Their neighbour, an elderly woman named Doña Maria, warned them on their first evening. Over a steaming cup of herbal tea, she shared the story of La Llorona. Centuries ago, it was said a young woman named Isabella was spurned by her lover. In a fit of rage and despair, she drowned her two children in the very lake that sat by the Hernandez's cabin. Overwhelmed by her act, she threw herself in afterward. Now her spirit wandered the lake, weeping for her lost children, 
and if she found any unattended child, she'd claim them, mistaking them for her own. Clara dismissed it as a mere tale to scare the children into obedience. That night, however, as the family settled into their beds, the wind carried a mournful wail. It sounded like a woman crying. Clara and Raphael exchanged nervous glances, but attributed it to the sounds of the wilderness. The following day was bright and sunny. The children, excited, dashed toward the lake, with Clara keeping a watchful eye from the porch. All was well until Clara went inside to grab some snacks. When she returned, she spotted only Mia by the water's edge. Panic surged through her. Mia, where's Diego? Mia, with wide, terrified eyes, whispered, he was right here, playing with the little boats. I looked away for a second and he was gone. The evening was spent in frantic search. Local folk joined in, scouring the woods and diving into the lake. Doña Maria, clutching her rosary, prayed fervently, but Diego was nowhere to be found. As darkness enveloped the area, a soft lament wafted through the trees. Mis hijos, mis hijos. The weeping voice echoed. Clara, heartbroken, recognized the cry of a mother's despair. It was eerily similar to the cry of La Llorona from the legend. Days turned into weeks, and despite every effort, Diego remained missing. The family was shattered. In their grief, they decided to leave the accursed cabin. On their last night, Clara, unable to sleep, decided to take a walk by the lake. The silvery glow of the moon illuminated the water, and in this light, Clara saw a figure, a woman draped in a long, flowing white gown, her face pale, her eyes deep pits of sorrow. She was gazing at the lake, her tears flowing freely. Summoning courage, Clara approached her. Isabella, she whispered. The spectral figure turned, her gaze piercing Clara's soul. Mis hijos, she wept, pointing at the lake. Clara, her heart pounding, whispered back, and mine. Please, Isabella, return him to me. The ghostly woman extended a hand, pointing towards a specific spot in the lake. Then, as mysteriously as she appeared, she vanished. At dawn, divers searched the spot Isabella had indicated. Hours later, Diego was found miraculously alive, floating on a large, sturdy lily pad. He spoke of a beautiful lady who sang to him, cradling him in her arms, protecting him from the depths. The Hernandez family left Montecito, their belief in the supernatural irrevocably solidified. The cabin by the lake stood abandoned for years until one brave soul dared to live there again. But every night, even today, if you listen closely, you can hear the mournful cry of La Llorona, forever searching for her lost children. The Deep Woods Cult, Satanic Rituals. Hiking through the dense woods of New Hampshire, Jeremy, Sasha and Alina were an adventurous trio. The sound of leaves crunching beneath their feet and the chirping of distant birds filled the air. A canopy of green shielded them from the late afternoon sun. They had a simple plan to find a camping spot before dark and enjoy the tranquility of the wild. But as the path they followed began to fade, Jeremy's GPS gave out. Looks like we're going old school, he quipped, pulling out his trusty compass. Sasha squinted ahead. Isn't that a building? Sure enough, wooden structures were peeking out amidst the thicket. The three friends ventured closer, realizing they'd stumbled upon an old, decrepit settlement. Overgrown with moss and vines, these old houses told tales of another era. Stone circles and altars blackened by old fires hinted at some sort of ritualistic practices. This place is giving me the creeps, Alina whispered. Let's get out of here. Jeremy, always the curious one, picked up a leather-bound book half buried under a pile of leaves. The cover was embellished with symbols of the occult. He flipped through it and found intricate drawings of rituals, summoning circles and sacrifice. Looks like this place was some sort of cult gathering site. Satanic by the looks of it. Alina shivered. Let's leave. Now. But Sasha, mesmerized by the history, suggested, why not set up camp here? It's already getting late. Against Alina's wishes, they decided to stay. By nightfall, they'd set up their tents in the heart of the abandoned village. The embers of their campfire danced with shadows, casting eerie figures upon the old houses. As the night deepened, a thick fog began rolling in, obscuring their view. Sasha strummed her guitar, the music echoing eerily throughout the settlement. Then, mid-song, she stopped, eyes wide, and whispered, Did anyone else hear that? There it was, a soft chant, harmonized voices singing a haunting lullaby that seemed to be coming from all directions. 
From the fog, dark shapes started emerging, figures draped in cloaks, their faces obscured. Panic surged through the group. Alina was the first to react, grabbing a torch and waving it wildly at the approaching figures. The chant grew louder, now accompanied by the soft beat of a drum. Jeremy, clutching the book he'd found earlier, shouted, Stay back, we have your scripture! But the cloaked figures seemed unfazed, encircling the terrified trio. As they drew nearer, the moonlight revealed unsettling details. Some of their hands were stained deep red, while others held wickedly sharp ritualistic knives. Sasha, her voice shaking, tried to find words of reason. We didn't know, we will leave, just let us go. One of the cloaked figures stepped forward, pulling back its hood to reveal an old, haggard woman with piercing blue eyes. You trespassed on sacred grounds. We've been awaiting a sign to continue our rituals. Your arrival is that sign. Jeremy, thinking quickly, thrust the book into the fire. The pages caught flame, and as the ancient scriptures burned, a gut-wrenching scream echoed through the woods. The cloaked figures fell to the ground in agony, writhing and contorting in unnatural ways. The old woman's eyes rolled back, her voice deepening as she muttered incantations in an archaic language. Using the chaos as a diversion, the trio made a run for it, the fog now aiding their escape. They plunged deeper into the woods, driven by sheer adrenaline. Finally, as dawn began to break, they stumbled upon a familiar path. Exhausted, they made their way back to civilization, the horrifying memories of the previous night forever etched in their minds. Weeks later, a local historian was interviewed about the lost village deep in the woods. Oh yes, he said, adjusting his glasses. The legend speaks of satanic rituals practiced by a cult that once resided there. However, they vanished overnight, some say cursed by their own dark magic. When asked about any recent disturbances, he shook his head. No one goes there, locals know better. But as the conversation ended, he added, did you know every few decades, hikers claim to hear soft chants in the woods, but when they follow the sound, they never find anything. The legend of the Deep Woods cult lived on, a chilling reminder that some places, no matter how intriguing, are better left undiscovered. Woods of the Faceless, Slender Man and the Nopera Bow Faceless Ghost. The town of Takeda was nestled at the base of a hill, and atop that hill was a forest so dense, birds refused to sing within it. The forest had a name, but it was forbidden to speak it aloud. Instead, locals referred to it as the Woods of the Faceless. In recent months, residents had started to go missing, and when they reappeared, they did so with no face, as if they had become part of a silent painting. Their loved ones would find them at the edge of the forest, wandering aimlessly. Yumi, a spirited journalist from the city, decided to visit Takeda to unravel the mystery of the faceless victims. She began by interviewing the family of the most recent victim, Hiroshi. Hiroshi's mother described the horror of finding her son without a face. I can't bear the silence, she whispered, tears flowing. His laughter, his smile, all gone. I've heard whispers of a legend, Yumi pressed, of an entity in the forest. The mother's eyes widened. Slender man, she murmured, her voice shaky. A faceless tall creature. He steals faces, or so the elders say. The name Slender Man didn't fit with Japanese law, but Yumi was familiar with the tales of Noperabo, the faceless ghost. Perhaps it was a fusion of both legends. Regardless, she needed to see for herself. That evening, armed with a camera and a flashlight, Yumi ventured into the woods. The trees seemed to huddle together, their shadows darkening the path. As she walked deeper, an eerie stillness settled around her. Only the rustling of leaves and her own footsteps accompanied her. After an hour, a chilling fog began to roll in. Through the mist, Yumi saw a silhouette, a tall, slender figure standing motionless. The fog obscured its face, or perhaps there was none to see. Panic surged through her, but her journalist instincts kicked in and she raised her camera. Flash! The entity vanished. Relief flooded Yumi, but it was short-lived. She felt a tap on her shoulder. Whipping around, she came face to face with Hiroshi, his visage blank and faceless. She tried to speak, but no words formed. Her flashlight revealed more faceless townsfolk, all moving toward her. Their expressions were lost, yet their intent seemed clear. They were drawn to her, as if wanting something. Before Yumi could react, she felt a tug at her arm. 
she looked down to see a small, faceless girl, her fingers cold and demanding. The child pulled Yumi forward, leading her deeper into the woods. The fog thickened and Yumi lost sight of the faceless villagers. The child led her to a clearing, where a tall figure stood, its form elongating and twisting. Slenderman. As Yumi faced the creature, the child vanished. Slenderman's lack of a face was disturbing, yet hypnotic. Yumi felt an overpowering urge to approach it. Each step made her mind fuzzier. She felt her identity, memories and emotions being drained. Just then, a loud, familiar ringtone pierced the silence. Yumi's phone. She instinctively pulled it from her pocket, the bright screen illuminating the surroundings. The entity recoiled, disappearing into the darkness. The ringing continued. It was a call from her editor. Shaken, Yumi answered, her voice trembling. Hello? Yumi, where are you? We've received news that the faceless individuals regained their faces once they left the town. We need you back. Yumi, still in shock, mumbled a thank you and started her way out. The fog was lifting and the path became clearer. By morning, she had emerged from the forest, the horrors of the night lingering in her memory. She looked back one last time, the woods of the faceless staring back, its secrets still hidden. Word spread about Yumi's encounter, and soon the once desolate town became a hotspot for thrill-seekers and skeptics. While most emerged unscathed, the brave few who ventured deep into the woods at night whispered tales of the Slender Man and the Noperabo, forever intertwined in the lore of Takeda. And as for Yumi, she left the world of journalism, seeking solace in the mountains. The woods of the Faceless had taken something from her, not her face, but a part of her spirit— Yet it gave her something in return, a story that she would pass down, ensuring the legends of Slenderman and Noprabo lived on. Thank you for watching, and remember the darkness awaits. Until our paths cross again, stay fearful and stay subscribed.